Welcome to Live Let Thrive, a podcast about the Airbnb life, the share economy, and everything in between. Here are your hosts, Micah and Steve. Hello, hello, hello. And welcome back to another exciting episode of Live Let Thrive. <laughs> What's up, the Micah man? I'm chilling, Stevie Stacks. How you doing? Good, good. Uh, it's a beautiful day. Cooled down a little bit today here in Tejas. So um, I had a, had a nice day. Uh, it was less stressful than, than yesterday. You know, it's up yeah. and down. You know this world. You know, ups and downs. And, um, and we have a, an amazing guest on this podcast. What podcast is this, Micah? LLT. And what episode are we on, Stevie Sacks? <laughs> this is Live, Let, Thrive, your favorite Airbnb, VRBO, HomeAway, Lyft, Uber, all that. Share economy stuff podcast in the world this is episode 179 and coming at you from arlington and fort worth texas and we have a special guest his name is clint harris should i introduce clint harris for a little bio on clint <laughs> what we got <laughs> like what we got what we got okay clint started off doing single family rentals in south and columbia south carolina then got into burr b-r-r-r-r method and but it was moving way too slow for clint So he moved to Wilmington, North Carolina, and three years ago experimented with a beach duplex. That's a nice play. Lived in one half, did 57,000 in the other, and that first summer was hooked. Wow, 57K in the first year. That's nice. From there, arbitraged a triplex and then another duplex and used the cash to buy two quadplexes, go back and buy the triplex and convert it into a quad, and then launched a property management company. They currently have 54 units, as he told me right now, instead of 51, 54 units, and are actively trying to buy a hotel and laundromat this year for full vertical integration and just launched an EV uh, vehicle rental component that will be direct marketed to the guests. He is a student of the game. Give it up for Clint. <laughs> Stevie Stacks and Money Micah, I have made it. I'm on LLT number 179. I have arrived. And I also had no idea how long-winded I was until you read that intro that I said. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I was like, what will it end? No. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Episode's over, folks. It's been great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man, you got a lot of stuff going on. So, uh, yeah, 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 you're telling me. I kind of told your story already. If you, if I left anything out or anything you want to touch on before we we roll into it, no, I don't think so. That's as believe it or not, that's as short as I can condense it. We've, we've had a lot of ups and downs and a lot of moving parts over the last couple of years, and it's it's got us to where we are. And uh, it, it's one of those things that it, it changes so fast; it's kind of been hard to document it. Nice, nice. So I guess from the, what I've noticed from the story, how did you start? How, how were you able to buy uh, duplexes and quads like right away and you know, off the you know beginning your real estate journey? So I, my main gig is in medical sales. I sell and implant pacemakers and defibrillators. I was in Columbia, South Carolina, working there and picking up uh, single family homes post 2008 crash. I could mm-hmm. buy a house for 25, 30 grand all in and rent wow. them out. And I was like, I sounded like every rookie, like, oh, man, I'm a genius. I'm renting them out and paying cash. I'm making, you know, 600 bucks a month off of each one. By the time I got 10, that's 60 grand a year. Now I can buy two a year in 15 years, I'm done. And the reality is it, it never plays out that way. Property management is a problem. The quality of the tenants is a problem. Um, you know, every time somebody moves out, you're fixing things up. And, and I just realized that the juice was not worth the squeeze. I did a couple of burr properties and hit a couple home runs, mainly by accident, not because I was good at it. Um, This was pre, you know, heavy podcast influence, pre Facebook groups and the ability to network. Um, And so I was doing the best I could with what I had in retrospect, the people that I was copying weren't very good. And I was terrible at the time, but I I did well enough that we did okay. Um, 2017, my wife and I, we did a couple flips. You know, we had the traditional, the first flip you're supposed to make 30 grand and we made eight. And then, you know, not understanding holding costs and everything else like that. Then we did another flip and we were supposed to make 50 and we made like 25. And then finally, we did a live in flip before we moved and made 85 on that one. So Mm. we were okay. I mean, you you get things wrong long enough. Eventually, you got to get something right, even by accident. Mm -hmm. So we moved to Wilmington, North Carolina in 2017. I took a promotion in my medical sales job. And the, the interesting thing was that was the first time we moved to the market. 
that had something more to offer than where we were at in Columbia. In Columbia, my first house was a house hack there. It was a duplex. It was a young man. I lived in one half, rented out the other and broke even. And that was really, that was my first property. I was I think I was 25 or 26 years old. And that's where I was like, this, this has potential to really change things. So from there, um, I, I thought I was hung in the back of my head, the house hack thing and how well that had worked for me as a young man. So when we moved to Wilmington, it was the first time I lived in a market that was desirable enough that people were interested in um, Airbnb, short term rental, VRBO and things like that, because it was a vacation spot. So at that point in time, we started heavily listening to podcasts. I uh, discovered AirDNA the ability to look back over data scrape from the, from the previous 365 days of all bookings across VRBO, Airbnb, short-term, you know, homeawaybooking.com and just really dive into those rental metrics. So I spent a couple months driving around with an iPad and um, we found a beach duplex at a small beach town right outside of Wilmington called Carolina Beach. It's a three bed, two bath in each half of the duplex. We bought it for 370. We moved into one half, did about 20 grand in renovations, and then started messing around with the Airbnb thing. Tried to use a very data driven approach from uh, the what we expected to get out of the property, the way that we staged it, the way that we operated it. And um, yeah, just did just under 60K that first summer. And the, that was really a, a there was a change in our mindset from that point on. Mm. So yeah. after that first year, we were the, the break it down. We were living two blocks off the beach. Um, we it paid the mortgage after the first month that we were there. So it paid the mortgage, taxes, insurance for the year, paid the utilities, and over a yearly average, we were getting paid fourteen hundred bucks a month to live there. Obviously, highly seasonal. But if you look at it over twelve months view, we were getting paid fourteen hundred bucks a month to live at the beach, and um, never look back. This that was the strategy for us. Hmm. And what market so, was this in again? This is Carolina Beach. It's right outside of Wilmington, North Carolina. It's twenty five minutes from downtown. We've got a the occupancy. It's a it's a good market. It's there's nothing that special about our market. It's the market that we chose. Like on the year, looking at our market, we've got 67% occupancy. This is pre-COVID numbers. And that goes from 95% in the summertime to 19% in the wintertime, which is kind of what you'd expect in a beach market. What we discovered is that there wasn't a lot of competition on, in our market for smaller units. A lot of them are larger beach houses, four to six bedrooms. So for us, the job was, the challenge was, what's the highest and best use of every dollar that we have to invest into our market? And for lack of competition and be able to focus in on one thing and do it very well. It was small multifamily properties that are two to four bedrooms, you know, two to four units each, one to three bedrooms each. So if we get a duplex, triplex, quadplex, then they have typically bad long-term tenants in place and we get rid of the tenants, renovate the property, fix it up. That first unit will pay the mortgage taxes, insurance, and then second, third, fourth unit is all profit. Ooh, I love that. But our, our, like I said, our market's not that special. Our, we're sixty seven percent occupancy on the year. There's another beach right next door to us that's also sixty seven percent. The other markets that are a little bit farther away from Wilmington are in the fifty six to fifty eight percent because they don't quite have the proximity to downtown as us. But there's markets like this all up and down the, the coast, and even markets in you know mountain areas that are have much better occupancy than we do. Oh wow. Wow. So, so did you know anything about beach houses before you got into it? I didn't know a thing about it. Okay. But, but I didn't know anything at all. But what I did know is that the short term rental space creates a positive and negative feedback loop that is a data source. I'm very much a data and a numbers driven guy because if I can use data to make my decisions, that's leveraging other people's past performance to dictate my future success. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that, if Everybody rates the property and the property owner rates the guest. That data is stored somewhere. And so it creates a data source of what people like, what they don't like, what properties they like, why they like them. And if you can find a way to tap into that and use that, we tried to use data sources from everything on um, what projection, rental projection to get on our properties, the best way to split it up with the unit density, the best number of people to put in the property. And then we purchased data from top performing Airbnb super hosts uh, that were a collective from everything from the color of the 5.4 millimeter LVP flooring to the thread count of the sheets to the LED daylight bulbs that are 3,500 lumens or better to the Wayfair wooden platform beds to the, to the locks that generate a new code for everybody else. My point is we didn't have to know all that because of the way that short-term rentals creates its own data source. If you can tap into that, 
other people can make those mistakes for you and you can use that to project your own success. Man. So, so <laughs> yeah, I, man, I got a couple of questions. So are you doing only, are you only buying or are you, you do, you, I mean, you do property management. Are you, which, which side are you on the buying arbitrage property management? We've had to do it all by definition to get where we wanted to be because we bought our first beach property. It was a duplex. We did just under 60K, 57. And then we're like, oh man, this is for us. But now we're stuck, right? Because there's a high barrier to entry on beach property. They're expensive and we were out of money, right? So how do I go get money? So the question is, well, how do you get listings if you don't have the money to buy listings? And that's where I know you guys do, Stevie, you do arbitrage. I know. And, and I know that like we, I didn't know what the word arbitrage was. We just needed a way to get more listings. So um, quick version is I found a triplex that was off market. It was actually on the MLS. It had just expired for the third time. Everyone seemed to think the property was way overpriced. I thought that the property was just drastically underperforming with bad tenants in place. So I cold called the owner. We had a 45 minute conversation the first time that we talked. Long story short, he ended up evicting the tenants. He did a little bit of work to the property. We painted it. He put LVP floors in. We put a couple of new windows in, things like that. We got interest-free credit cards. We staged the property. He was nice enough to defer the rent for three months. We launched those three units. The only money I spent was $4.99 on whitepages.com to get his number after pulling all the information up off the tax records. He fixed the property up. I managed the renovation. I drove up to, we drove up to Raleigh, took his wife to dinner. They're lovely people. They're very dear friends of ours now. Um, he put the money up for the renovation. I managed the renovation. We paid for the staging with credit cards. He deferred the month, the three months worth of rent. By the end of the second month, we had paid back the three months worth of rent. So we were a month ahead. And then uh, we paid back all the money that we put down for the staging. Those three units that first year, we paid $36,000 in rents to him. Um, and then we did 125 k in gross rents, and we had a wow. net of 54. And after we made that 54 grand, now we had money to go buy, right? So, Micah, to answer your question, I had to do arbitrage because I didn't know another option. After that, we took that money, the money that we were able to save from getting paid to live at the beach, and then we bought a quadplex, same thing, bad tenants, horrible, uh, great location, great potential, horrible tenants, horrible past performance. We renovated the property, did 165K in that quadplex, mm -hmm. uh, and then took the money from that, bought another oceanfront quadplex. And um, that's where we are right now. Then we went back and bought that arbitrage triplex with owner financing. The upstairs unit was a two bed, two bath. It's worth a little over $50,000 a year gross. The downstairs was a two bed, two bath. And then it had a small cottage out back, which is our best performing unit for what it is. We just recently took the downstairs two bed, two bath and split it in half because it's got a back entrance and separate parking. And we made it a one, one and a one, one because it's worth 45 K a piece as a, each of that. So added another, you know, roughly $40,000 to the gross rents on that property. Mm. I, I want to everyone to just really listen to how powerful what he just said is that that is powerful. He used arbitrage, get more properties. Then he went and found underperforming properties, bought them, turned them into short-term rentals and just kill it. Man, I love that. That's awesome, man. Go ahead, Steve. I know you had something to say. That's, <laughs> wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny. Cause I mean, you said you use the data uh, to figure out what, you know, what's the most profitable way to do this and learn from other people's mistakes. That was, that was cool. I mean, there's so many things you said that it's like, wow. Um, air DNA. I mean, you mentioned that earlier and you think that's worth it for us, for people to pay for the air DNA. So I do. And a lot of people don't, and I'll, I'll tell you this about that. This people say it's an incomplete data source or it's, um, you know, it doesn't work everywhere. There's data anomalies and things like that. And I, I completely agree. But I would also say is that at this point in time, as far as I've seen, it's the best benchmark data that we have available. So all I can talk about is what I know about my market. What I know about my market is that if you just look at gross rents of the median performance in our market, that's how I know about the occupancy and the average daily rates and the seasonality and how to beat the seasonality. In our market, the seasonality shows that the occupancy in our market is 19% in the wintertime, right? This is like November through the end of February. But what I know is that the occupancy is not 19% spread across all the available listings on the market. It's just the top 10 to 15% of markets that are performing at a high level stay booked pretty well. And the rest of them are going to stay empty with the exception of Thanksgiving, Christmas, graduation, and a wedding, 
or New Year's, something like that. And if the larger properties are going to stay booked during the summertime, when dad's taking his week off of work, the family's coming down, it's a big family, multiple families, grandma and grandpa are coming, things like that. They're coming for a week at a time in, in the summertime. By focusing, looking at the data and seeing that there was a hole in the available properties and the occupancy on our market, what I saw was the smaller units that are one or two bedrooms, those groups are very nimble in the marketplace. I can book that a Tuesday through a Thursday real easy when a guy and his girlfriend in Raleigh decide that they're not working at the Cheesecake Factory those two days and want to drive <laughs> down to the beach. Or if the surf's good and people want to come down and go surfing. Or if, or if I've got people that are travel nurses or working in film industry driving down to Wilmington and they realize, hey, I can drive 25 minutes and work at the beach. So the difference is there is that especially the first year, I'm not really chasing revenue. What I'm doing is I'm looking what's the highest occupancy that I can get into my properties. Because every time I have somebody stay in there, it's generating a review. My job is not to chase revenue. My job is to farm reviews. And if you have the property right next door to mine, they're identical. And we both roll into the winter time and you put a three or four month renter in your property. And I'm specifically marketing, even though my average daily rate comes down, I can keep that property turning. I can generate an extra 25, 30, 35 five-star reviews. It does two things for me. Number one, it keeps my cleaners working through the off season. I can afford to pay my cleaners really well and keep them busy all year. So it's not so seasonal for them because the cleaning fee doesn't change. On top of that, I can generate those extra reviews and rolling into the next season, even though your property and my property still might be identical, I can charge $100 to $150 more per night because I'm on the top of page one and now you're on the bottom of page two. What y'all know is the same thing that I know is that you're never sitting still in short-term rentals. You're either rising or falling. And if you don't know which one it is, you're falling because somebody else is working to make sure that in some way they're getting that exposure. And if you don't chase revenue, but you chase reviews, the revenues, the reviews give you the option to leverage up the revenue down the road. That is amazing, man. I've never heard that before out of all these shows that we've done. You know, I've heard, really? I've heard, uh, not, yeah. I mean, 179 <laughs> shows. And I, this is the first time I've heard chasing reviews. And, 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 here, and here's why it's different than what a lot of people do because they say, man, you know, I could, I could fill the midweeks if I wanted to. I'll make it so much in the weekends, but I'm not going to raise, I'm, I'm not going to rent it below $200 a night. I just refuse to do it. I don't want that type of tenants in my place, you know? And, and I see, and I see, I know it, it might be different for a beach, you know, a beach house or a beach condo or something like that, because you know, they're coming to the beach, they're going to enjoy themselves, whatever. Whereas uh, you let someone, um, you know, you, you try to rent it for too cheap in the city and downtown, you might, you might get some, some clients like that. So I've all, but I've never heard them say, I'm going to lower it instead of putting some plug in, you know, that's what I was thinking, like a beach house. You just, okay. The winter time, you just plug like a, a winter text. We call them winter Texans when they come here. You know? sure. And we just plug someone in there for, you know, cheap 1200 bucks a month, just, just to cover those, those slow right. months. And then, and then get back, you know, churning when spring break comes, but I, but you're, you're, you don't care if you make less money on those months is, but you're, you're getting these valuable reviews. And, and you said you'd be on page the number one on page one. I mean, God dang, that's, that's, that's a well, great way to look at it. There's I, no, what you said is actually right about, look, let's get a tenant in there. Let's make some revenue through the winter. If I had a bunch of three, four, five bedroom beach houses, that's not what I have. I have small quadplexes that are one or two bedrooms for each unit. People in that space are very nimble in the marketplace. And there's not a lot of competition there except for like big condo buildings or hotels and things like that. So there's a space for like, look, just get through the winter. It's a six bedroom house. Nobody's going to come rent it. But if I've got small places like that where people are nimble in the marketplace, then I can hit those numbers. And I mean, I'm not dropping it down to dirt, you know, really horrible levels because I don't want to attract the wrong kind of clientele. Like they can't even book my properties unless they're minimum of three, five star reviews and previous hosts, uh, ID verified, that kind of things. Like I'm still making money, but the real value for me is not the money I'm making right now. It's the money I make when we roll into the next off season because I'm in a highly seasonal market, right? My market is a bell curve. Anybody can rent anything out here during the summer. You can rent a wet cardboard box out in your backyard and it's the beach. Someone will rent it. <laughs> Where I make my money is by the being the first one to book up in the spring or the last one to book up late into the year. And I still stay booked in the winter, even though I'm not making a ton. I'm building those reviews that are going to up my game significantly in the next season. And if you just look at the data and you hold yourself accountable and that's your report card, what I can tell you is that pre-COVID, 
Um, we were the occupancy on the island, 19% through the year. We were at 71% November through February because we were keeping that rolling and just keeping people in there. We did that several different ways. We did it by being pet friendly, um, putting washers and dryers in, things like that, trying to listen to the market. Now, since COVID happened, pre-COVID, like this time last year, summertime the year before, we're averaging 900 to 1,100 clicks on each one of our short-term rental listings uh, per month. And of that, the pass-through rate is 3 to 4%, right? So call it 1,000 clicks a month, 3 to 4% of those people are bookings. So we're getting 30 to 40 bookings out of those 1,000 people. Obviously not all for the next month, but sometime in the next four or five months. Since COVID happened, right now we're averaging 4,500 clicks on each one of our listings per month. It's four and a half times the traffic. The average length of stay in my properties jumped, and these are small properties. They typically have small, short stays. It went from 3.6 days to an average of 6.6 days. We shut down for two months, March and April during COVID. As soon as it opened back up, it went off the, to the races. We ended the year. We caught back up on the year, even losing those two months. We caught back up by the second week of October. We ended the year at an all-time high by about 30%. Um, and so what we had to do is learn how to listen to the market. And what was the market telling us in the year before it was, how close are you to the beach? Do you have beach shares? Is it pet friendly? And then once COVID happened, it was, how good your internet? Is there a workstation? Can my kid do school remotely? Can my husband and I work remotely? So even though I've got all small units, we went and we put washers and dryers because the data was telling us that people were going from 3.6 to an average of 6.6 days and they need a washer and dryer. And we ripped out our reading nooks and our coffee stations and we put in workstations and lamps and chargers. And it, it made a difference. And so some of it is you can look at data and past performance. Some of it is you got to look at the market and try to adjust and the reason that works for us is because we have those small multifamily properties and we try to stay nimble. Yeah, I dig that. I dig that. You got some questions, Micah? Oh, man, I, I got a bunch because uh, <laughs> not only are you talking about market. man. I told I warned you ahead of time. I get really excited about this. It has changed our life and I get excited and I talk too fast. I apologize. You're changing <laughs> listeners' lives right now. So keep on yeah. going, man. Uh, I wanted to touch on what you talked about at the beginning because you, you gave me a hell of an idea. You said you're buying a laundromat for vertical in integration. Are you buying right. this laundromat for your short-term rental guests or how is that going to no. work? So after being pressured by some of the other, my wife is full-time real estate agent on the island, by the way. So um, after a lot of the other agents she worked with were exposed to our rental units by seeing them because it's a small community and by seeing some of the numbers that we were getting and how our units were staying busy through the winter when nobody else. So uh, after a lot of pressure and resistance, we started a property management company called Going Coastal Property Management. We partnered with a couple other agents on that. Um, we thought we were going to have to advertise. We did not have to do that at all. Word of mouth kind of blew up for us. And here's where the vertical integration is. And I'll try to kind of pick up the pace. Um, everything you do in short-term rentals, it, it, there's, it creates so much opportunity. Mm -hmm. So what that means for us is we needed to create our own cleaning company. Bef this is before we started the property management. We wanted to create our own cleaning company because I want to have full vertical integration. I want to control our cleaners. I want to pay them a great wage so that they can live well. I want to keep enough people in my properties through the winter that I can keep paying them all year long and they don't have to leave and go find other jobs. Uh, and I can build rapport with them and I can have good people on board that we that stay with us year round. They're not allowed to go clean other people's listings. I want them to clean mine. We're not dropping linens on a bed in a garbage bag and the guests make the beds. We're making all the beds. We're doing high end, You know, trying to do everything to the best quality that we can, because that's what's getting those reviews and those reviews are what's getting the revenue, right? Mm. So those people for ver vertical integration have to work within our portfolio and that's it. So from there, when we went and started doing property management, same thing, we picked out the plumbers, we picked out the handymen that we could blast them with so much business that they take care of us and they don't have time for anybody else. They're not bringing on new clients. They're cleaning, they're taking care of our properties, they're fixing our properties, and that's the way it is. And so from there, um, it creates a need. All of a sudden, we've got 12 to 15,000 pounds of linens every month, right? 12 to 15,000 pounds. And we're talking about partnering with a laundromat and we're paying them around a buck 50 a pound, right? This is a lot of revenue, okay? So then the wheels start turning. Vertical integration, does this create opportunity? And the actuality is it does. So we've tried to buy a laundromat. The reality is because we live on an island, we've got hard water and we also don't have propane. The propane has to be come in in tanks. And so 
there's some obstacles that we've tried to navigate and tried to buy a laundromat that's existing here because the impact fees of building a new laundromat are really difficult to overcome. So for right now, we just signed on some warehouse space and we're building a linen facility in the back of it. In the future, my plan was, uh, and still I'm trying to find the right way to do this, is if we buy a laundromat and we do a dollar a pound wash and fold with a profit margin of around 60% on that, I've got 12 to 15,000 pounds of linens coming in the door right now. That's 12 to $15,000 a month in revenue. Um, we are easily going to double that before this next summer. So then anybody walking in front of the brick and mortar laundromat off of our island coming in to use it, that's just additional revenue. But really it's about being able to control the quality of the linen service. We, you know, owning the linens, owning the cleaning company, owning the linen cleaning service and effectively owning the handyman or the contractors by giving them so much business that they always do a great job for us. They give us a great price and they're not looking anywhere else for business. And they're effectively turning other people down because we're, we're keeping them going. As long as we do our job ethically, morally, and are trying to do things the right way for the right people, keeping in mind that this is a small community, we want to look local, feel local, be local. We do all that the right way. Then that vertical integration allows us to, uh, to control every aspect of the business. And that's how you maintain a quality standard. Mm. <laughs> that's amazing man um uh, pro props on the name by the way going coastal that reminds me of the going postal term back <laughs> to <the> ec <laughs> sometimes i feel like i'm going crazy man i get it <laughs> yeah man i, I mean you, that i mean just to just, like you said just the way you explained it you know i mean why pay uh, another laundromat to do all that all that thousands of pounds of laundry right pay yourself to do it Right. I've already got people that are coming to our warehouse, picking up linens, dropping off dirty linens, picking up clean linens, taking them out to the properties, cleaning all the properties, doing the beds and everything like that. Like all we need is a facility with storage out the back that we could do wash and fold out of. Um, and it's I've got the personnel. We've got six cleaning teams with 17 cleaners on them. And those people are, Jeez. you know, they're happy to look for extra hours because right now they're working between 10 and four. Right. That's most of the time. Sometimes when we don't have people staying overnight. They can clean the property the next day, but other times they're working inside of a window and we pay them really well for that window, but you know, they may want to go work extra hours and do a couple hours of linens here and there. And we just have a linen facility that's constantly rolling. You can come in and get as many hours as you want. The linens go stack straight on the, the shelves, Kings, Queens, whatever. And people come in, grab them and roll on. Um, yeah. So that's how that works. And we try to be really careful about the property owners that we partner with, with property management, the properties that we select, we use a da very data-driven approach to make sure that we have a mix of larger properties, smaller properties that are going to meet our needs in terms of revenue for the company. They're also going to meet the needs of our ability to keep the cleaners working. Um, it also, selfishly, I I'm completely hands-off with the property management company operations at this point. We have operations partners, but it allows me to take all my properties and just drop them in at half-price property management so that now... I focus on going, I do acquisitions. I go look for other properties. I try to buy them. I try to find underperforming long-term rental properties, convert them to top performing short-term rental properties, drop them into our property management, and then go find more. And that's, that's oh, oh, go ahead, Mike. <laughs> I don't know. We both had questions on that. So <laughs> when you're going and finding these properties, are you doing traditional? Are you doing like 20% down to buy them, create a finance? And how are you financing those properties? So that's a great question. I, I've done I've done traditional, I've done commercial, uh, I've done owner financing on a quadplex, uh, and so that's going to depend on the deal. The market that we're in right now is so competitive that, and you know, it's part of it's our fault, but the market would have figured it out anyway. We blabbed a lot about what we've done. We've written a lot of posts about it and put stuff out there and and helped friends do it. And you know, small community like right when it's an island, like they're not making any more of it. There's only so much. But at this point, people here know what we buy. They bring us deals. I still do quite a few, a little bit of cold calling off market, things like that. And so um, if people are willing to negotiate owner financing, then I'm, I'd love to have that conversation. Those are the magic words, right? But if not, uh, we've developed commercial relationships where um, we can buy things that based upon the gross rental projection of the property. And so even if it's properties in bad shape, and not performing, and it has horrible rents right now, I can give them a projection of what I know the property will do. And because of the relationship we have and what they see we're doing with our other properties, basically they say, their one question is, okay, is Going Coastal going to manage it? I say, yeah. They're like, okay, then we'll give you the loan. And at this point, we've got the revenue coming in from other properties that I, I don't mind 20% down. So I'd love to do less, but I'm not going to do less. At the, you know, our, our job right now is to secure 
safe long-term debt. Mm. I get a better rate on that with 20% down. That's fine. The money that we have coming in, we're, we don't spend a dime of it on us right now. It's going straight back into buying more properties. And then hopefully this year, like I said, laundry mat, we got a laundry facility going in now, but eventually laundry mat. And then, um, yeah, we want to do a, a hotel. We want to do a small boutique style, invisible service hotel with a la carte booking. And we'd like to brand it. I love that. I love that. Uh, going back to like when you were you're saying you're doing all these different things and, and trying to buy a laundromat and do, you know, and got the management company acquisitions, everything. And at what point, what point in your business when you were growing, like you started growing like crazy, I, I'd imagine. And did you, did you say, man, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta start, you know, outsourcing as much as I can. I gotta start hiring people. When, what yep. point did you say, I gotta work on the business instead of in the business. And how did you, how did you transition to that? You just nailed it, man. You just said on the business, not in the business. And there was a transformational moment for me. Um, I I I listened to a lot of podcasts. I listened to a lot of audio books and things like that. There was a book that hit me right when I was beating myself up over how are we going to do this? And how am I going to do this? And I can see how it all needs to come together. But how can I do that? And how can I do this? And there's a book called Who Not How that was transformational for me in that I realized that I had built a network around me of people that were very, very capable. And I had a problem with being able to let go because I know the numbers. I know the data. I can see where it needs to go. Um, I'm a visionary, but I'm not the best operator in terms of getting there. Right. I'm a big picture guy painting in broad strokes. um, And I've just had to learn how to accidentally or maybe just blessed to have surrounded myself with people that are significantly better operators than I am. And so there, I listened to that book and I had a moment and the moment was, I don't have to look at all these different pieces that we're trying to put together and say, how do I do that? I had to look at it and say, who do I have that can do a better job at this than I can? The reality is most people I know could do a better job of it than I can. My job is to recognize the best person on our team or where can we go find the piece that we can add to our team that can handle that part of it. And when I learned to let go a little bit, things started to move really smooth and really quickly. And again, we pay people a great wage and we get beat people to buy in to the excitement of what we're trying to build. And so um, I'm a very team kind of guy. I think that the whole is usually greater than the sum of its parts when the right people are put together. And I think that if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, build a team. And I don't get excitement from managing properties or having Airbnbs. I get excited when checks come in. But I get excitement from going and finding properties that have hidden potential and creating value to me, what feels like out of thin air. After I've got it and it's operating and it's basically a beach ATM, I get a little bored with it, but I want to put it into a management. We couldn't find a management property that did what we needed a management property to do in order to hit the numbers that the data said that we should be doing if we were operating at a high level, right? And I think the model that most of the property management companies in our market operate in is they manage three to 500 properties. If your property rents out, it rents out. If it doesn't, it doesn't. They don't care. They get their commission and they can make up for it with quantity. Our model is to be the same thing that I want from my portfolio is the same thing that we want for our property management company. That's boutique style, small. If we stay small, we stay nimble. We can maintain a high quality standard. It means we have to select our properties carefully. We need to select the owners that we partner with carefully. Really, we need to operate at a very high level because we can't make up for it with quantity. But if we do all that, we have the opportunity to create something really special. And the only way that gets done is what you said. If I have time along with our operating partner to work on the business and not in the business. And the way that we do that is we don't look at different moving parts of the business and we say, how do we do that? And how do we do that? We say, who do we have that can do this? And then if we need to expand that, who can we find that they can teach that can do this and find people that operate on a better level than I'm capable of? So it sounds like to me, you've partnered with other property management companies, or did you build your own property management company? Nope. From the ground up, we partnered with a a friend here on the island who also owned a triplex, and he was living in the front house and renting out the back to and doing 82,000 gross between the two of them. Uh, 41 in each. And so we were bouncing ideas back and forth off of each other and helping each other. Um, And so when I had, you know, triplex going, quadplex going, quadplex going, he's got another duplex that he brought on 
um, that we partnered on together to do arbitrage with after that first triplex, that owner's just talking word of mouth with the guy two doors down, like, man, you got to see what these guys are doing. They pay ahead of time every month. They're taking great control of the property. They told me if I ever want to sell it, that they want first right of refusal. They took away my CapEx. Used to be when a tenant broke a toilet or broke a window, I had to get it fixed. Now they get it fixed and they have to get it fixed before the next guest gets in there. They've got professional cleaners in the property every two or three days. Um, if I ever sell it, they want to buy it first. If they're not going to buy it, they said they'll give me a maximized rental history that shows what the property has done in gross rents over the last year. And all of a sudden, that same property is not underpriced. It's drastically overpriced when it had set on the market before, right? So we're creating forced appreciation from him for him. And so that forced appreciation creates a lot of value and he's just really happy. And by definition, if you ever call someone to try to do arbitrage, they're a real estate investor, right? You already have common ground. It's easy to talk to that person. So he um, talked to a guy two doors down that had a duplex. So my partner, Sean and I, who's partners in Going Coastal, uh, we partnered on that and brought that up to speed as an arbitrage unit, did very, very well. And so he's, we're both continuing to invest. He was a chiropractor by trade and within a year, quit his job as a chiropractor and his full-time operations manager for going coastal. Um, now he just handles the maintenance delegation. We have people handling all the messaging. We have managers handling all the cleaning. And then he and I just bought some little electric vehicles to start a uh, vehicle rental company that we direct market to guests in some of our luxury properties. Mm. And so, and so you said people, you know, you, you, you got rid of the, the messaging, which is like a, a big headache. How, how did you do that? Did you hire VAs? No. So the messaging, I mean, you can automate so much of it these days, right? Like right. You write, have the right software like, hey, Stevie, thanks so much for booking the Sundown Cottage. Look forward to your visit. You'll get automated instructions the day before your scheduled arrival. Like we have an average of 12 touch points with our guests from the time they book all the way through their stay, thanking them and giving them checkout instructions, reminders the day of, things like that. Anytime anybody messages in and is like, you know, a lot of a lot of the things with short-term rentals is uh, it's an algorithm, right? And so one of the things you get judged on is how fast you reply to your guests. So we set a timer that if we don't reply back in 15 minutes, no matter what time of day it is, they get an automated message that goes back to them um, so that it keeps that keeps the algorithm thinking we're very, very active, right? Another thing is like there's several tricks to the game. And a lot of times you get a search engine, op it used to be this way, you would get a search engine optimization bump if you were a fairly new listing. Because if you're a new listing, the algorithm wants you to have success. Because if you have success, you're going to make money but and you're going to keep doing it. And then the algorithm makes more money as well. So we had software that would take our listings down at 11.59 p.m. and put them back up at 12.01. So we got a little bit of an optimization bump that way. <laughs> it would go into our descriptions, add a couple punctuation marks, and then take them out. So it looks like we're really, really active. You can automate most of it um, so that it made it really, really easy. And then we... Looked at the VA route. A lot of people are going that route. But again, we're a small island community. A lot of the questions are about our small island community. I can write answers to the questions and somebody else can spit them out. And we do that. Like if you ask me the best barbecue place, I'm going to save the word keyword barbecue into our software and write a great description of this is where we go. This is what we like, blah, blah, blah. Next time you send something in and ask something about barbecue, if nobody responds in 15 minutes, it's going to auto-populate that answer and send it out to you, right? So it's a learning algorithm, but still with 54 listings that we're managing, we want to look local, be local, feel local. And so we have people that we hire locally that are our managers and drive around the island all day. Uh, we put them on a base salary and then um, that's what they're doing is running around and helping basically put out fires, hopefully not literally. Um, <laughs> but by, you know, we try to be very careful about our properties that we select and our owners that we select and the guests that we allow to stay in our properties. Um, and so I think that most of the headaches you can avoid by a proper guest selection before they book. Um, but no, that's, we do everything with local people and we're willing to pay for that because I think you get what you pay for. Nice. I mean, I got a lot, a lot of questions now. So do you, okay. own, now do you only use Airbnb? No, we use air. So you have to look at the data. And right now, the data for the properties that I own, 81% of the bookings in our market for smaller units come through Airbnb. Then it's another 15% come from VRBO. And then a combination of booking.com and, and 
other sites and things like that. So for me, and the thing about what we learned is that 81% of the bookings are through Airbnb. They're the days that would book through VRBO are not days that in my units that we wouldn't have booked anyway. On the larger units, you know, four to six bedrooms or six bedrooms plus, a lot more of those are in the VRBO space. So we use multiple platforms depending on what the data tells us is going to be the best marketing plan for that property. But ultimately, we have a direct booking website, right? We get a lot of repeat guests that are direct booking. And our goal rolling into, let's say we get one, you know, after the first six months to a year, especially a year two, our goal is to get a minimum of 20% direct bookings equaling 35% of revenue. Hmm, I love that. Now so we're pushing, yeah. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was gonna say. Now, what what PMS system are you using? The property management system. Mm-hmm. So we use. Oh man, you're gonna make me give away my secrets. <laughs> we can take it off here. No, no. <laughs> no, I'll tell you the the one that I use for my personal properties that we started out with that we've been happy. Now we use a combination of a couple different things. We used some pricing software. We always did everything manually until finally we found an algorithm that worked pretty well for us. Uh, right now, I started out the first management software that we were really happy with was um, Your Porter. Um, there's not much to it. It's really no bells and whistles. They've recently been bought out by Guesty. Um, so that means the price eventually is going to go sky high because that's what Guesty does. Um, so when we started out using Your Porter, it was $7 a month per listing. So we locked that in. We got a few extra bells and whistles when they were really small. They work with us and help us. Um, just We were able to tailor things that exactly the way that we wanted. Right now, we're experimenting with a couple different things, and we kind of have a hybrid model that's working well for us. Again, with the direct bookings, um, that's something we're trying to get a lot better at and bring in-house. Um, there's two words that we haven't talked about yet, but vertical integration, I think is something that would be really good. If we can find a way to create our own software, ultimately, I think that's the goal. Yeah. I, I was wondering on the PMS side, cause I'm currently on your reporter, but I'm, my goal is at the beginning of the year to switch over to hostfully. So I was just seeing if anyone else. I've heard good things. It. Wink, wink. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, you, listen, you, the thing about, the thing about your reporter, it's a fantastic platform. They did it the right way from the beginning. They were young. They they had a lot of things that were still getting right. But once it gets bought out by Guesty, that number one is a compliment to them. They did a great job. But also, you know, the price isn't going to stay the same. So it's time to start looking. That, 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 the day that they got bought out by Guesty is when I started looking. So I already knew it yep. was coming. So, <laughs> and one more question, and this might help you, Steve. You said you have certain things you look for in an owner to manage their property. What are those things that you look for? So the number one thing is what are your goals with the property, right? Like if I, I'm an investor. I'm, I'm not a young man. I'm 38 years old, but I feel like I'm young enough that my goal should always be cash flow, right? So I'm looking for, if I'm going to buy a property, I need to buy a multifamily property and make a minimum of like absolutely bottom floor, $1,000 a month net profit after all expenses are paid, right? So if I'm buying a triplex, I need to take home at least 36 k um, and that's after all cleaning fees, lending fees, you know, mortgage insurance, everything. And frankly, it's been really easy to, to blow that out of the water. That was just the arbitrary number that I originally set out of like, this is what we want to do. Right. But our first triplex, we did 54. So, and then from there, anyway, that, that was the benchmark that we set and what we wanted to accomplish. And I think that for me, the goal is well, I need to make as much revenue as I possibly can. Cause I'm trying to do some really cool things with my life. And I think this is the vehicle that's going to get me there. If I'm partnering with a property owner, it's what are your goals? Because if your goal is to make a bunch of money or get a certain return on investment, it can be hard to do that, especially if you're buying a big, beautiful beach property. Like if it's oceanfront, six bedrooms with a pool, like no problem. We're, we'll do 145 grand a year there. Like not a problem at all, even if it's not in that great of shape, right? But if you're buying a four or five bedroom house, it's a couple blocks back. And we think that it's nice enough that it's going to fit in our portfolio. It's going to meet the needs we have for our cleaning fees, teams, the occupancy and seasonality and everything like that looks good. There's some value add opportunity that we can build in there as well by putting in, like making it pet friendly, putting in a jacuzzi, putting in a pool. One thing we're doing right now, by the way, is um, my cousin drove down here not long ago and his Tesla was like, man, I could not find a rental space that had an EV charger. I said, say that again. <laughs> um, stick, 650 bucks to put one in, by the way. And there's several places where you can put the apps out there and that will show up so people see places they can rent with the EV charger. Wow. Yeah, put that into the ether. That's something that's generating a lot of buzz. So anyway, we're looking for value add opportunities, but mainly in your question to who's the property owner we want to partner with, it's the guy that says, 
you know what? We bought this beautiful beach house. We'd like to use it a handful of weeks out of the year. I'd like for somebody else to pay for it. Um, and, you know, besides that, we're, you know, we're not going to come stay for two months during the summer or th- something like that. Like we just want to eventually retire here. And in the meantime, we'd like for it to pay for itself. And then um, we'll use it when it's not being rented out, that kind of thing. And um, people that give that buy into what we're doing from a data driven perspective, the pricing software and formula that we put together, the value add components that we have, we'll do things like um, create micro listings where, you know, you close off one part of the house and rent it as have a listing up as a four bedroom and as a three bedroom or and as a two bedroom. When you get into the dead winter months on those bigger properties and, you know, we can risk split it out. So that as soon as somebody books one of them, the other listings get taken down. Obviously the cleaning fee is going to be a little bit lower. Um, and, you know, we used to be able to do that and keep the reviews all together. We can't do that anymore. It's split it out. So we don't do that as much anymore. But basically, a property owner, their house is going to hit our number of what we need to make as a, a property management company. And then they're going to allow us to try to be nimble in the marketplace and listen to what the market is telling us. And if that means putting in a workstation uh, and things like that and putting in charging stations and lamps or an EV station or making it pet friendly in the winter months or something like that, we don't have to do all that. But as long as they realize, hey, I think you guys are better at your job than I am at your job, that's the perfect partner for us. Now, it sounds like, you know, you're not afraid to try different things. And uh, and you talk about that cross integration, stuff like that. And um, and you got seems like you got the Midas touch. You're making great money. You're doing things the right <laughs> way. Now, I just want to ask um, <laughs> What what have you tried that didn't work out so well? Like one of your your favorite mistakes, favorite favorite failures that led to some led led to something very successful for you? Can you think of something like that? Oh man, so many. Um, <laughs> <laughs> try you know one thing. One of the beautiful things in my market of especially my personal portfolio is uh, unit density. Right? If I if I have a one to one ratio of mortgages to rental units it's hard to get ahead there, right? If I've got one mortgage, one set of utilities, one set of taxes, one set of insurance, and one rental unit, the revenue from that rental unit is going to be cannibalized by that set of fixed overhead that I've got. But if I've got multiple units, then the first unit can pay the mortgage taxes, insurance, and everything like that. If they're on one deed, and the second, third, fourth can all be profit margin, right? So if I have the opportunity to go in and change that unit density, um, then that creates tremendous value. A slippery slope there is How do you put a good product out there without getting too greedy um, and packing people in, right? Because like, I'm not trying to make myself a budget hotel. I'm not trying to make myself a boarding house. So one thing that I struggled with originally was if I'm going to take this property and split it into multiple units, or it just is multiple units, how do we make it together but separate, right? So we've got to have clear, and things that we learned just by getting it wrong is um, clear delineation of parking, parking signs gravel to tell people where the parking lots are, things like that. Um, Another thing that we got wrong was on multifamily properties, people go into the wrong units and things like that. Mm. Um, Wrong door, knocking on the door in the middle of the night. Hey, I can't get in. So (laughs) we had to make it really clear. Like when people check into the property, here are pictures they have to click through. Like, this is where you park. These are the stairs to your unit. And then things like, um, like, noise pollution. I've had to get really, really good at learn how to get rid of noise between upstairs, downstairs units and in between walls and things like that, because I did it wrong at first. And I mean, it's too long of a conversation of how we fix that. There's all kind of different, you know, spray foam and hanging brackets and false ceilings and LVP underlayment, like an eco silent barrier you can put under LVP that really helps with contact noise. There's contact noise versus ambient noise. It's a whole thing. And the reason I know that is because we got it wrong. So a combination of I think that that's the trickiest thing for us is unit density, multifamily properties for maximized profitability, learning how to navigate that and trying to remember, don't fix the problem for today. Fix the problem so the problem is fixed forever. And next time you see that problem, you know how to fix it. Um, And then, you know, another thing is with the automatic locks, making sure that people got their own codes that were each generated the day of checkup check-in that didn't activate until 15 minutes before because we've had people show up a day early multiple times. We've had people thinking they were checking out a day late, things like that. So the automated reminder text is helpful. And then don't have a code that's the same code from one guest to the next where somebody shows up, they walk in and somebody else's suitcase is on the couch. Mm. You know, 
things like yeah. that. Mostly if, uh, everything I've learned is from something we did long, wrong. And I mean, it's a long, long list. <laughs> you, nice. And you said you, you had issues on the multifamily side. And it's funny because I, I have a I'm, I'm currently transitioning to houses, single family in that I'm mm-hmm. in that transition. Have you found like multifamily be more of a headache than single family or which one do you lean towards? Multifamily is definitely more of a headache to get up and running mm-hmm. uh, in terms of the renovation. You got four kitchens or whatever, you know, there's, there's just four of everything and the crazy, like you'll turn around and set down a hammer or your contractor will, and then turn around and go back to get it. And it's not there. And it's in the unit that's identical that's next door. It's, it's so confusing. <laughs> it's, it's 10, even though it's maybe two or three times a unit, it's 10 times the headache uh, to get it up and running. The reason that I do it, it's twofold. Number one, it's wildly profitable because of the um, the unit density compared to the fixed overhead. And I own a property management company that's going to do it at a high standard and I can drop it in there and those people do it and I'm willing to pay them for that. And then I don't have to deal with it anymore. So if, if I, it's, it's really hard to find a property management company that will take those types of property on because they're trying to make so much per door, right? Like I, we try to make so much per door and it's harder to do that on a triplex or a quadplex than four big standalone, big, beautiful beach houses. But I own the company. And so we built a system that if the company's going to use my system, then it can use my system on our properties. And when I say I, I mean, I built it with partners who are wildly contributing, the operating partner full-time and, and things like that. So um, yeah, there's definitely hurdles to overcome. And I would say for the average Joe, it would be really, really difficult if you didn't own a property management company that could be very specific about the way that they get managed. Now, so so when what was the moment where you quit your job? You quit your job? No, man, your day I love job. My job. Your day job. I love my, I love my day job. So I, I'm still doing. Oh. It. I still sell in pacemakers and defibrillators. Um, my here's the problem. So I got to be careful about what how much I have to say about this. <laughs> I love my, I love my job. Um, my wife is a full time realtor here on the island. Things are coming to a head, and at some point, um, we're gonna have to make a decision. But I'll tell you this: I, I love my job. Uh, I think you can tell that I love real estate and I'm very passionate about it and we're, we're not going to stop. We're going to keep doing it right now. um, I've got the opportunity to do both and do them at a high level because I've got a really, really good team around me that if I can find the property and point it out, then they can kind of take it from there. Like I said, I do acquisitions. I buy properties. I manage the renovation, which at this point I've got really, really great contractors. And at that point I turn it over to my wife and our interior decorator that works inside of our company they stage it, they get it up and running. It gets dropped into the company and I don't see it again. So like it, when it comes time for a hotel or for branding and branching out to different markets and things like that, I think that we'll have to see, have a serious conversation about that. But at this point, the machine and the team that we've got to put together, again, the, the sum is, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. All those people working together make it really easy for me to go do what I like to do, which is find a deal get the deal, um, manage the renovation, turn it over to them. And then I don't touch it again. So at this point um, I can, I can do what I love and do, you know, my job at the same time, which I also love. You, you know what? I, I've started to notice this. My guy, Byron Holman, he, he's in the, um, he's a, he's in the, uh, the medical med space. He's a, he's a, he's a nurse. And what I've noticed is he loves his job too. And I want you to maybe, maybe you can answer this. I notice people that love their nine to five job who are into like real estate and stuff. They are very quick to build the systems for that real estate because they know, Hey, I have this over here that I love, but I need to have this systematized. Is that kind of how you were able to hey, so quickly get everything up and running and start your own company? Absolutely, man. I think that really resonates with me. The way that I look at it is I love my job. It's, it can be a high stress job, um, but I love it. But there's going to be that I don't love it, right? There's, the day is going to come when that's not what I want to do. And that's not the day that I should be looking at what can I put in place so that I don't have to do that anymore. If I want to reach a combination of like we all are looking for financial freedom, right? But I think that if you look at, you broaden the pie a little bit and you look at it, then we're looking at financial freedom. But what good is financial freedom if you don't have freedom of time or freedom of location? If you want financial independence, then the only way to really embrace that is if it comes not at the expense of time or location independence, right? Like if you need to be able to go anywhere in the world to spend the money that you've made with unlimited amount of time, right? If you have that, 
those three things, you know, call it the triangle of freedom. I've heard that expression. But if you've got financial freedom, location independence, and time independence, that creates independence of purpose. And when you have freedom of purpose, you can look at what you want to do with your life on a bigger level, whether that's family or charity or skiing or fishing or, or whatever it is. But right now, if you're if you have one or two of those things, if you're location independent, which more people are right now than they ever have been, that's great. But you still got to sit at your computer because you got to work and trade that time to make money. Right. So you can have the location independence. Um, but if you've got the location independence and the financial independence, but you got to dedicate a certain amount of time to focusing on that. That's not the level of freedom that I'm looking for. But I think if you can find a way to get all of those things, it creates freedom of purpose. And freedom of purpose is where life gets very, very interesting. So to answer your question of what your friend's talking about, I love my job. There's going to come a day when I probably don't. And the time for me to prepare for that and to build the systems I need into place so that I have financial location and time independence is to build that now. <laughs> I never heard of how you broke that down. I love it. Go ahead, Steve. I love that. No, that's it's some, it's some great stuff, man. This episode is chock full of great stuff. Um, one thing I was going to selfishly ask you. So we're going to um, we're going to start managing a, a beach house in Rockport, Fantastic. Texas. Yeah. Right. I've never managed a beach house before, but we, we told the dude, yes, we can, we're going to kick some ass for you. OK, it's it's awesome. one of those that you talked about. Big five bedroom with the pool close to the beach, maybe like a a block from the beach you know it's not on the beach what the fuck do i do man <laughs> so first thing you should do is look up an analysis on air dna and see what you should be looking at so the air dna you know is scraped from the past 365 days of bookings across airbnb vrbo homeawaybooking.com and it's going to give you a median projection of how that property should do in terms of the median gross rents uh Average daily rate, occupancy, average daily rate is highly seasonal. So you can kind of throw that out the window. But that median projection means that when it's pulling all the data around there, it means somebody's the best, somebody's the worst. And if you're the middle guy, that's what that median projection is. Now, when you look at that median projection of your gross rents, you got to know to back out the cleaning fees and the linen costs. Because the cleaning fees and linen costs are scraped with that data too, right? Because some people charge a high average daily rate and no cleaning fee. Some people try to charge a low daily rate and a high cleaning fee and squeak it in. So your job, if it's a five-bedroom house, you're probably going to be spending somewhere around 28 to 30% of the gross rents towards your cleaning fees and your linen costs. And you know have to know how to back that out uh, and give him a realistic projection so that he knows what to do with his money. And then um, from there, that should be your report card. You should be holding yourself accountable by... You know, again, explain to him very carefully. You don't want to start out chasing revenue. You're going to make revenue in the long run. But if you create a partnership where you both want the same thing here, you should have the freedom to do what you need to do to be nimble in the marketplace to go after reviews. If you get those reviews, it will give you the opportunity to leverage up and generate revenue on the backside that will continue in perpetuity. Like it. High end photography, high end descriptions. All that stuff. You know all this, man. Right, 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 Not right. That yeah. hard. That's <laughs> you're right. It's just it's the same thing. It's the same thing, but on a bigger scale. Yeah, this is gonna be the biggest place we've ever managed for somebody, right? But it's awesome, gonna be man, it's gonna be it's you. gonna be yeah, I'm yeah. gonna be calling you every single day. I hope you don't mind. Put in an EV <laughs> charging station. Really put in there, an EV, in char- put an EV charging station, pro boat, like do it yourself, 650 bucks. Don't tell them how much it is. She'd be like, man, I got you. Where's your box? With your permission, we're going to come in. We're going to pay for the high end. This is what I'll do with my high end clients. We pay referral fees to the realtors bringing in. If I look at a property and I say, we're going to make 14 grand the first year off of this and it's going to go up from there, then um, if it needs something, like, yeah, we'll pay a thousand dollar referral fee to a realtor that brings us a property, no problem. And then we'll pay for the high end photography. We have a photographer that works exclusively on our listings. Um, she does an amazing job. I think that it makes a difference. And again, the first person to strike in that market, it's a positive, negative feedback loop. If you're the first person to do something and what that is, you don't worry about what that is generating more revenue. You worry about what that is generating more reviews Then anybody that comes after you that does the exact same thing will never catch up to where you are until the day that you stop operating. Hmm. I know we're going long on time here, guys. <laughs> oh, no, no, because you <laughs> I told you I get excited. I can't help it. You just got me excited because I got some houses and I'm thinking about this. Hold on. Have you seen like a revenue spike by doing the EV charging stations just so for it's, night? It, it's really new for us. It's really, really okay. new. Um, so 
we have, but the problem is that spike came during peak season for us. So I don't think that I can use that as reliable data, right? Um, it, it's cool that it has it and people are willing to book it. A lot of those people seem to be, they're smaller units. People tend to be booking it last minute. And even though I've got like four identical units on an oceanfront quadplex that we have, and we have it more expensive on that unit, how do I know that they're just not willing to pay that? And, you know, because of price elasticity, I stretched it an extra instead of $345 a night for a one bedroom, it's, you know, 415 or 435 or whatever. I, I don't think I can really answer that for you until we have a chance to roll into the off season. We get into that shoulder season, the off season, and I can look at the number of people that are clicking on the link of the one that has the EV. I can see how long they're staying on that. And I can see what the pass through rate is of how many people charge it. And then uh, how many people book that one. And then I can look at how many people use the EV charging station and, uh, and are willing to pay for that. So nice. I can't, I can't give you that answer without a data source. And right now I got to wait until I become my own data source. You know what? I, I just from the outside looking in, I think it would because of who has the electric vehicles. It's a different tier of a guest, right. like Teslas, right. things like that. And I'm like, if I had those, man, I could put that out there. These are a different caliber of guests you're attracting, man. Good luck building, to you on those. Yeah. Thank Good you. Luck. You're building exclusivity. Yes. And also, yeah. So I'm sorry. I, we could, That's a whole other round. <laughs> and also, yeah, yeah, like, I'm serious. Say <laughs> Go ahead. What were you going to say, Clint? No, I was going to say we're leaning into the electric vehicle space. Like we're trying to do something there. Like the vehicles that we bought. Have you guys ever heard of a Moke? Oh, what's that? You see here. You see that? Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I've seen those. A little Land Rover looking thing. They used to be, there used to be diesel. They're real popular around the Bahamas, the Caribbean and places like that. They got famous when Sean Connery was riding one around in a 007 movie a long time ago. Oh. Well, an American company recently bought them out and turned them into electric vehicles. And uh, they just showed up in North Carolina a couple of weeks ago and we bought three of them. We're on an island, right? If not here, then where? So we got one that just showed up and two more that are on the way. And so after people book one of our properties, we've already got their payment information, their ID is verified and everything like that. We've got reviews on them. Then we can look at the calendar. We can direct market and send out a text blast to those people and offer to rent those as well. How, how much did you charge to rent one of those uh, a night or a day? That is a great question. So price elasticity is we got, what we got to look at. We got to see how far we can stretch the price before it starts affecting the occupancy. The golf carts in our market are rent for 125 to 150 bucks a day. We would, we would we would be north of that. The, the golf cart company here on the island has 150 of them, and it's as fast as they can get them in, charge them, and get them back out through the summer. Um, we get a pretty good head turn reaction when we drive these around. Um, so I, I don't know. We're just starting that. If it flops, then I get what I want. And somebody else pays for it anyway. And what's more American than that? If we just keep it in the company, so, uh, I, I think it's I think it's going to work. Again, I don't have a data source, and I'm a data driven guy. But on this one. We've got 54 listings, so if you give me a couple months, we'll become our own data source. We'll be able to put some projections for you. How much does a Moke cost, by the way? 20 grand. That's, That's not it? bad for well, electric. Get, so 20, if you get the bells and whistles, wooden steering wheel, stuff like that, it's like 23. But, you know, a golf cart right now, like a nice raised golf cart, have you seen, they're like twelve to $14,000 right now. Like because Holy. of COVID, boats are expensive, what? cars are expensive, <laughs> golf carts are expensive. Not, it doesn't make any sense. But it's the reality. So because we are, have, you know, the properties, not so much the ones that I own, but the properties that we manage are high end luxury properties. We're creating exclusivity. We're getting those direct bookings. I think we have the option of doing direct marketing. This I don't have to go pay for a billboard. I don't have to wait for people to call us. I don't have to put up Facebook ads. After you book one of our properties, an hour later, you're going to get a text with a picture of this vehicle. Like, hey, a lot of our people are interested in, you know, booking this while you're here. Would you like this to be waiting for you at you're listening when you arrive and we'll pick it up after you leave. It's this much for the first day. And then it goes down every day that you book it out. And if they say, no, that's fine. We go to the next listing and we blast them the remaining days on the calendar. I mean, it's a direct marketing surgical campaign. You, you know, it reminds me of, and it's probably someone with your same mindset. Um, I have an agent down there in South Padre because I've always been looking to buy a condo, you know, just for me and the family to have plus rent it out, of course, Airbnb. And, um, and there's and she, the the place she worked at it was it was called like South Padre Island you know condo rentals or what it was the old school place where you go and you you get to the beach oh we need a, we need a place to stay you go to this uh, building and you talk to the guy he says oh, okay we got one over here and here's the keys and here's the towels you're gonna use and it's just old school right you know and and they and they handle those those properties whatever anyways he the guy retired he sold his he sold his business he just he put it up for sale sold it to somebody who knows who bought it. But the first thing that person did 
they noticed he had a big parking lot area for that space. He filled it up with the uh, with golf carts, man, to rent out on the beach. You know, he took advantage. He he, you know, he noticed a, an opportunity and some this guy wasn't even utilizing. You got all this freaking space right here, and it now is just chock full of of um of golf carts and cool little golf cars you can you know rent around, rent and probably making a shitload of money. It probably paid for itself, right? And so <laughs> yeah, cash on cash return is like I mean, based on the best numbers I can do, it's like ten months cash on cash return for even for just paying cash for a couple of them. I mean, listen, the, we're just trying to listen to the market. We could be wrong on this, but like right now, five to six people a month are like, hey, you know, we're, we're coming from never been there before. Where can we rent a golf cart? Where can we find a place? And they're asking for referrals. And it's just like, are we really just going to sit here and be like, here, send them over to this guy <laughs> when we could buy something cool and it'd be a write off and, you know, potentially generate a lot of extra revenue. I've got the personnel, right? I've got the cleaners at the big warehouse. That's got linen facility in it. It's got plenty of indoor parking for vehicles this size to have, you know, 15 or 20 of them. They're going to the properties anyway. I've got the staff. Like, why can't I just load them up in the moats with advertising on the moats? But you can only book one if you stay in one of my properties. And I've got a little platoon of moats going out across the island. And then somebody just running back around to pick them back up uh, because they're doing delivery and pickup. Like, I don't know. It makes sense. But we could be wrong. Give me six months. We'll see. I have a quick. Oh, go ahead, Steve. I was just thinking about you wouldn't just leave it there on the property. So when they even if they didn't book it while they were talking to you, they get there like, damn, this is really cool. Let's, let's book this thing. You know, you're going to just leave it there. Not a bad idea. I'd probably be driving around myself, but we could. <laughs> <laughs> what were you saying, Mike? What, one question I did have about the electric vehicle chargers. Did you go into like Airbnb and select electric vehicle chargers and see how many people have them in your area? No, nah, I wish you could put it in as amenity like that. My, my plan you can right now, now, right? I, I think so. there's not in our market. I, my plan is to drop the emblem on our front cover. There's um my cousin, what my cousin and all of his little Tesla buddies do is they look, there's an app that shows you different properties available for rent that have them. And like, it's on there and you, it's free to upload properties on there as well. So, you know, what I've the website to, is? I don't, I'm sorry. I'll Google it. Go ahead. Yeah, please do. So that's all. Um, we by the time we put them in, we're already booked up for the next couple months. So I'm not going to be able to have an idea of how well they're working and how that's going. Uh, until things slow down and they're the ones still booking and the other properties aren't right. You know, so it's like, it, it's hard to see, but I, what, what we are getting is tremendous feedback from the guests. Thank you. Oh man. I'm so glad we could bring my car instead of having to drive my wife's car or vice versa or something like that. So the response is there in a way that I know people booked it for that reason. So then where we're going to see it is when the market slows down, is that going to be something that's going to increase that occupancy as a world? And I, I believe based upon the feedback that we see that it, it certainly will be because we've already increased the rates and we're getting that. And it's just 650 bucks either way. So whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's one nice day in some of our properties. No, right. Man, it's been a great episode, Micah. What do you think? Yeah, it's been a great one because I just did what I asked. And like in the market I'm in, it's only nine places with electric vehicles charged. That is important for you to know. I am, I'm, <laughs> I'm installing them. Thanks for, yeah, thanks for that. I'm plus, <laughs> plus, Micah bought the book, Who Not How, while we were talking, I'm sure. Hey, my I, man. I, I added it to my book list. That's what I was doing. You know? I'm if a you're book building nerd. a team, if you're building a team or putting together a system and you believe that if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, build a team and you need those people around you that are better operators than you are, then you need to be able to answer that question. And uh, that book is what what did it for me. So I'm glad, man. I hope you get something out of it. He's a, he's a great author. Thank so, you, man. What, what excites me about this this whole industry, man? It's like, I mean, if you look at our screen, it's three dudes in their in their rooms, in their you know pod room or whatever, in the bedroom, whatever the hell, talking about all these things and how to run a successful short term rental business, right? And it's like, it's still the wild wild west, and it's still it's so many so many uh, innovative ways to do this. And it's like you you don't see Mr. Hyatt, Mr. Hilton talking on a freaking podcast about hey how should we do our, our hotels better no no it, it, this is like this is this is the new wave man and it's still there's still so much to you know so much gold to dig and and, and we love it we, and we love that you hopped on our show and shared a lot of it with us oh man thank you it's an honor you're exactly right early adapters of new technology that are existing in a positive negative feedback space whoever gets there first is going to have an advantage you guys have created you've turned yourselves into lightning rods 
for short-term rental space, good ideas, people operating at a high level, certainly people operating at a much higher level than I am. I've listened to your podcast and there's not a day that you're going to be able to do this that you don't get something from it. I believe that real estate, specifically short-term rentals, it's the real estate business, but it's the people business. We are in the people business. And by putting you guys in the situation that you have, you're drawing people to you. I can't wait to see how it's going to pay off. And I can't wait to watch your journey. Man, thank appreciate you it so much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for Thanks, having me. Where can people fun. find you, uh, Clint Harris? I'm on, yeah, Clint Harris. I'm on Facebook, Carolina Beach. My wife is an agent, Abby Harris, with Nest Realty in Carolina Beach, or you can track us down at goingcoastalpm.com. That's PM for property management. Man, thank you. Thank you for coming on, man. It's been an honor. You've dropped a whole lot of gems, a lot of value. Thanks for coming on, and thanks for being a listener. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Y'all have a great one. You too. You too, man. Bye. See ya, dude. <laughs> wow, that that man, that electric vehicle play, man. I'm I'm serious because I've been like trying to find ways. How do I provide some value that nobody has? Electric vehicles, and not only are you providing value, you're getting a specific type of guest. Who the hell has Teslas? Man, these people with a little bit of money, they got yeah. Teslas. You know, and you mentioned Tesla too, but Ford, their, their goal is to go 100% electric. And that's exactly. And, and they're pumping out trucks, 20, 30 grand for the, the normal person can get into one of these electric vehicles. Yeah. But it's only at this point right now, I think it's so easy to get in. It should be so easy to get in because those, those people haven't really hit the surge wave yet. Right now, the wave is Tesla. You know what I mean? And I'm reading this book, Surge. Might as well, if y'all ain't read this book, man, there's some powerful shit in here. <laughs> uh, this book, Surge. And then what he's talking about, it, I'm like, that's the wave. That's the surge right now. You got to have cater to a certain type of guest, man. I'm like, that right there, that's I'm about to go price some shits right now. Yeah, 650, and you know, that's not bad. Yeah, and, and then the nine places that I looked at that has electric vehicles, like four of them are hotels. They ain't even houses. Like it's like wow. two or three. I'm like, oh yeah, bro. I'm all in on it's that. It's on. It's on. Yeah, I'm all in <laughs> on that. I'm like, oh that, that this dude here, he's charging 150 a night for a damn uh two bedroom house because he has an electric vehicle charger. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, bro. I'm, I'm, I'm in there. I'm in there. But yeah, man, great episode. Another great episode, 179 in the books. Clint Harris, look him up, going coastal PM. Look us up, live, let thrive at gmail.com. Send us an email, uh, live, let thrive.com. Uh, we're and we're on Instagram, all that stuff. Yes, sir. And, um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for continuing to listen to our show. I guess it's, it seems like it's inspiring people and it's, it inspires us every single time. So we love doing it and we love bringing this information to, to the masses. Yeah, man, it really has, man. It really has been inspiring, man. When I saw all those people who've actually tagged us on Instagram, I'm like, oh, shit, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, thank y'all for that. that. That's much love. I'm happy we've been able to provide value over these last four years, man. Uh, and we're going to keep pumping out content. Keep doing it. Keep living, letting, and thriving. We are out. Later. Peace. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Live, Let, Thrive. Be sure to tune in next week for all the latest in the world of Airbnb and all that entails. Bye-bye.